and welcome to Keep the Channel Open. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 22. So today on the show, I'm talking with Esme Weijun Wang. Esme is the author of one of my favorite books this year, a book called The Border of Paradise. This book, I read it back in June, July. It's now September as I'm recording this. And I've kind of been thinking about it ever since. It's just, you know, fantastically well-written, great prose, perfect characterization, and it touches on, or maybe, I don't know, maybe I should say it's about a lot of things that just struck me as profound about family, um, immigration, interracial marriages, uh, how trauma gets passed down from generation to generation. There's just so much in this book and it's not even very long. It's under 300 pages. Um, you know, when I finished reading this book, I kind of just had to sit for a minute. That's how impacted I was. So I was definitely excited to get the chance to talk to Esme. And not only because I loved her book, but also she's just one of my favorite people on Twitter. She's uh, She's got a great blog where she writes about creativity and resilience and mental health and illness and just generally, she's one of the most gracious people I have the pleasure of talking to online. And we had a really good conversation that I'm happy to get to share with you. Now, if I could just switch gears a sec. Uh, if you've been listening for a while, you'll know that I used to include a little sort of editorial monologue at the top of the show, just talking about whatever was on my mind. But I quit doing that a while back. Anyway, the whole show is still sort of uh, work in progress. I'm still working my way around, figuring out exactly what I want it to be. But I was thinking that at least sometimes I'd like to go back to that talking about stuff, stuff, maybe not in every episode, but when I've got something on my mind. Anyway, so today I was talking to my therapist about this photo project I'm working on. Actually, about a bunch of different projects I've worked on over the years, but particularly about this one I'm working on right now, which is about the town I grew up in and nostalgia and the feeling of not being able to go home again. There's a lot of stuff in there that I could talk about that, um, that I have talked about in different places before. But today I was thinking about the emotional process of making the work. Because, you know, all of my work is really about sort of analyzing these different emotional experiences I've had in my life and trying to put that into a photograph in this way so that the viewer can recognize it. And when I first started working on this project back, uh, I think it was about five years ago now, something like that. Well, this whole thing came about because I had just gone back to visit my hometown for the first time in like seven years. And I'd moved away a while before that to go to college. And then I stayed down in Southern California. And then all all of my family and friends moved away from that town where I grew up. And then I just didn't have any reason to go back. It's not even on the way to anywhere. Um, But just one day I was in the area and I decided to swing through. And I found myself having all these really intense emotions about how it had changed and how I'd changed. And without even really thinking about what I was doing, I just started taking pictures and that's what turned into this project now. But what's really interesting to me is how, even though at that time, at that time when I first started taking those pictures, those feelings of sadness or loss that I was having, they were really acute, but they're not anymore. Somehow in the process of poking at these emotions and analyzing them and trying to figure out how best to put them into the work, after doing that and focusing on it for so long, a lot of the edges really came off. The way my therapist described it was that doing this artistic work was a way of integrating these difficult emotions about my past into my present being, which... I thought was just a really interesting thing. And I think maybe when you work from your own life and struggles, when that's what you make your art out of, I don't know if it's possible to spend so much time taking your experiences apart and putting them back together without gaining a certain familiarity with them. And then that paves the way toward acceptance and wholeness. 
Anyway, I, I know I'm far from the first person to think about the therapeutic value of art making, but this is just what was on my mind just now. Hopefully that's something useful to you. If you want to chat a little bit about that, the email address is podcast at keepthechannelopen.com. Let's, uh, let's get to my conversation with Esme Weijun Wang now. As I mentioned, her debut novel is The Border of Paradise, available from Unnamed Press. It's fantastic. You should get a copy. I've got a link in the show notes for how to do that. Uh, now here we go. Here's Esme and me. I, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. I'm very excited. Uh, I enjoyed the hell out of your book. <laughs> I am really excited to hear that you enjoyed the hell out of my book, and I'm <laughs> really grateful that there are people who want to read it and do read it, so thank you. I, I was trying to think about, um, I do this every time I end up talking to somebody for the show, I, I try to th- remember how I how I came to your work, and like a lot of times I cannot actually remember. In In your case, I think that I found you on Twitter first and found your, your blog first actually. And then Ah. it it wasn't until afterwards that I, that I found your book. And I always just sort of think that's sort of backwards. I think how a lot of people find authors on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, reading your book was how to put this. It was such an impressive piece of craft was the first thing that really struck me as I was reading it. And particularly what I I found really interesting uh, just as a first cut was like on a craft level was how you have five different point of view characters and they all speak in the first person and Mm -hmm. each one of them has just this very distinctly different voice. (laughs) Yeah, I think it ends up being actually like seven points of view in total, including the omniscient last chapter. Mm -hmm. Oh, just just to get this in here, uh, the book is called The Border of Paradise. Right, right. (laughs) Okay. Um, But yeah, yeah, so that's a thing that happened. Yeah, and I thought that was just a really interesting, um, like really impressive uh, as a writer to be able to to be able to make each character feel so distinct, um, the way that each one of them speaks, it, they don't, they don't feel like they're coming from the same person, even though obviously they are. Mm. Um, and that just, you know, as a person who tries to write from time to time, I'm always impressed by, by things like that. They, it, it's a lot more difficult, I think, than what a lot of people might realize. <laughs> it, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, and I do get asked about, the use of diff- so many different points of view, and it definitely wasn't how I intended to write the book. The book actually started the, for the first maybe year and a half or so of the book's life. It was just William's point of view. So mm. the only part that existed was the chapter that's now called The Arrangement, where William Nowak, who is this very, I think he might be the most what you might call voicey character, where his voice is just so bombastic and a little bit ridiculous um he he uh has this very very um distinctive voice and i think part of the reason i ended up going and writing these other points of view that happened for a number of reasons but one of the reasons was i realized william's voice could not carry an entire novel like Mm. I could not imagine anybody wanting to read an entire book of just William's voice. Like it, I like it a lot, but it's a lot to take in, in large doses. Um, and that brings up another interesting thing that I think you and I talked briefly about on Twitter, which is people's very different and very strong reactions to the different characters. Mm-hmm. There is, I'm really actually surprised by how I, I kind of thought that there might be like one character that everybody liked more than all the other ones or that people would have similar reactions to the different characters, but that's actually not the case at all. I, I, yes, just yesterday, um, actually, am I allowed to curse? On oh, this? sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yesterday I got this tweet that I thought was hilarious. It was like, I'm about a hundred pages in and David is such a fuck boy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, because there are people who really 
love David as a character. And I think I've actually had people tell me that their favorite character, I, I've had like multiple people tell me that different people are their favorite characters. Mm-hmm. And I even read a Goodreads review, which I don't recommend for to people. And I actually <laughs> don't do this anymore, but I did read a Goodreads review where they were like, I hate everyone except for Sarah. And Sarah is the dog. So <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, so that was, uh, it was interesting for me because you were, kind of live tweeting the book not quite kind in of, detail yeah. but but you were saying that you were having these different reactions to especially i think the male characters which i thought was interesting yeah what i found so just to back up i guess for the listener so this this book is the story it's a multi-generational story of uh, a sort of interracial family starting back in the 40s i think or in mm-hmm. the, yeah. yeah in the 40s and so you have David Nowak and and then his eventually his wife who goes by Daisy in the United States but mm-hmm. that's not her actual name which mm-hmm. that in itself I think was really interesting to think about how names operate. Mm-hmm. Their children William and Jillian and then the, the later another character Marianne who is a I don't want to give too much away but she's a, a major um character in David's past and in the children's lives. Mm -hmm. And this thing about, you know, each character, I think to me, like this idea that that you find different people connecting with different characters or being turned off by different characters, I mean, really speaks to the strength of the book itself. My reaction to each one of the characters, it was really interesting to notice. I I wrote down a whole bunch of notes as I was, (laughs) as I was reading um, and, and, and sort of live tweeting, which, just to pause for a second, the the experience of live tweeting a book. I mean, that's something. <laughs> it's very it's very 2016. I feel like it's not something it I ever would have done in the past. Mm, I loved it. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I what I was noticing with each character is that like, I I went back and forth so many times with each character that there would be, and this was something that I thought was was uh, really interesting. How you built each character in a way where there's a, a a deep sort of, I don't know if sympathy or empathy is quite the right word, either one, there's a little bit of both, but then each character has also something about them that is kind of off-putting, like that mm-hmm. sort of distances the reader. Mm-hmm. And the different, like in each one of them that manifests differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was just really fascinating as a reader to 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 have such a an arc with each character. You know? Do you think do you think human beings generally are this way, or do you think that was something specific, like a specific type of viewpoint in the book about well, the way people operate? I think that I mean, in reality, I think that we all contain multitudes. Uh, mm-hmm. If I can be cliche for a second, but uh, <laughs> but I I don't think that you see that as often in literature. Um, mm-hmm. And so having it it made each person in the book feel more like a a real person. That's, that's good. That's something, (laughs) well, something that I used to say about the book when people would ask me what it was about. And by the way, I'm very impressed by the way you summarized the book because I still cannot. And it's July. The book came out in April. It's been months for, for me to be able to refine my elevator pitch and I still can't do it. It's always um, easier with somebody else's work (laughs) than your own. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, back when people used to ask me what what is your book about, I would say it's about people who do things because they think the things that they're doing are the best for the people they love and end up screwing up things very badly as a result. Mm-hmm. And 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 I I kind of still think that's what the book is about. And so many of the things that make different characters off putting is the stuff that they do because they love someone or love multiple people or think that what they're doing is something out of love. I don't know. It's, mm-hmm. it's still something that I think about. I mean, to me, it's, uh, one of the things about it is this this sort of tension and conflict between the story that each character is telling about themselves, is saying, is telling themselves about themselves, mm-hmm. versus how their actions actually affect. <laughs> the other people around them and this, yes. because you get to see this from each different perspective like 
you get to see how it actually plays out from other people's points of view. Like the chapter you mentioned with William, he has a, as you say, a sort of bombastic, it's a very, you know, teenage boy, like, like, you know, a loner teenage boy, grandiose <laughs> language. And he, he views his relationship with his sister in a particular way. When you come to the next chapter and it's her point of view, she sees it obviously in a very different way. And you get to experience both sides of that. Yeah, I just loved the way you described people's narratives about themselves and how that differs from the way they affect others because it's such, because it's the way that we all interact with one another, right? Like we all tell ourselves narratives about the way we are or what our personalities are like or what kind of person or people we are. And then that ends up, it plays out differently because life is complicated and the way we relate to other human beings is complicated. Yeah. There's a line. I can't remember exactly which is in one of the David sections where Marianne and he have just had an encounter and, and she says, you're not careful. Um, mm. And that I, I actually wrote down the exact line, but I can't find my notes right now, but it was, <laughs> uh, that really struck me as just so emblematic of, of how, how, how the narrative for each character works because everybody is sort of wrapped up in their own heads mm -hmm. and has trouble seeing things from other people's points of view. It's like sort of the tragedy of actual life, you know? Yeah. Like she says something like, you're not careful. You don't think anything you do affects other people or mm -hmm. something like that. And I think that so easily happens um, in, in quote unquote real life outside of fiction. And I know this happens with me all the time and I try to be aware of it, but it's very easy to, yeah, just to get stuck in your head, to get stuck in this narrative that's happening about your own life and the story that's being created by your everyday being. Um, and, uh, other people are, are telling narratives in their heads about their everyday being as well. And mm -hmm. then we all crash into each other and, <laughs> and sometimes it's good. Um, it's not all bad, but sometimes it can be very painful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this, this book, um, I'm really, I'm, I, I'm, I, I finished reading it several weeks ago at this point and I'm still, I don't know, kind of haunted by it. It's, it, there's, there's something, you know, it, it was it, another thing that was that, that we, we talked about a bit on, on Twitter that, that definitely bears on this story is because it is so much a story about trauma mm -hmm. and, and how that, how that plays out for each one of the characters. But I think a big part of how any particular reader is going to relate to the story is going to have to do with you know, each reader's relationship to trauma in their own life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way that this story, I, again, I don't want to give anything away, but the arc of the story is, is it's, it's neither wholly redemptive and neither wholly like tragic. There's mm -hmm. elements of each expressed. And that also makes it feel very real. Like to have things tied up too prettily would be, it would be too easy, but to have things just be completely awful for everybody would also feel wrong for the story. The, the way that, that, that things play out in the story feels very true, um, in a way that these things have lasting effects for each one of the characters. They can't just be, you know, tied up with a bow mm -hmm. and, and thinking about, about that thinking as particularly the the final image really it, it it left me in a place where like haunted is really the only word i can think to use like or i i, I can't stop sort of thinking about these characters and, <laughs> you know and and where they're going and what's going to continue happening yeah um it's interesting that you mentioned the final image of the book because i've also had some strong responses or reactions to that it is an ambiguous ending and it's interesting to see how different readers contend with that some people really choose to believe one thing about the ending and some people 
choose to believe something else. I think, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like literature is like one big Rorschach blot Mm -hmm. and you just learn a lot about the reader by how they interpret what's there. But yeah, I got, uh, immediately after a friend of mine finished the book, she wrote me an email and I, I think it was just like one sentence. It was like, Oh my God, does blah, blah, blah happen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and that was it. And, uh, yeah. And I just had to write her back and say like, well, it it depends on what you you think. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, but another thing that you mentioned, um, about trauma is I think something that I still think about a lot is how trauma isn't just about kind of the direct object of the trauma, like the trauma, that each person experiences in the book resounds through the generations and affects other family members. It affects the people they love there. There's kind of an idea too of intergenerational trauma, which is something that I studied in graduate school actually. Mm. And in graduate school, I really got attached to this idea of immigration as trauma. I was very interested in the idea of, how this thing that happens all the time, which is people immigrating to other countries, ha- contains a lot of shock. There's, you know, there's language and there's not quite belonging and, you know, there's racism or um, prejudice and all kinds of things. And most recently, my mother, who immigrated to the United States from Taiwan when she was in her early 20s, sent me a bunch of scans of pages from her old journal and they're all pages from when she had just gotten to the u.s and i was a baby and she's writing about being in a new country and trying to survive and she also recounts the memory of saying goodbye to her parents at the airport which i thought was so sad Mm. um but yeah I, i remember receiving those scans and reading them and just crying because I could not imagine being in her place. I couldn't imagine. I mean, I'm in my thirties now and she had me when she was in her early twenties. I can't imagine being like 22 and having a baby and having just arrived in a new country. And it just seems like there's a lot Mm -hmm. to have to handle there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something I think, um, you know, my, uh, my family has been at least, you know, some parts of my family have been in this country for like five generations. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's interesting, this thing that you're talking about with your own family also shows up in the book, this sort of trauma that gets passed down. I think, you know, even though it can be muted after enough generations, I think there's like having a, an immigrant family mm-hmm. really informs a lot about um, your family, the story that your family tells about itself and how you and your family re- relate to the uh, place where you live. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's definitely in, in the book. I think it's interesting to, to consider how, how that feeling of foreignness can continue on down in the generations despite you know, people like you and me being born here Mm -hmm. still always can retain that feeling of foreignness. Mm -hmm. And in your book, that's like actually really literalized in how William and Jillian are raised, Mm -hmm. um, completely separate from the rest of society. Mm -hmm. Um, But I found it really interesting to consider how each one of the characters, whatever their background might be, whether it's David or, um, or Daisy or William or Jillian or Marianne, each one of them has this, this feeling of, of isolation of, of being the other Mm -hmm. along multiple axes, whether it's race or gender or sexuality, uh, um, Marianne's brother, Um, whether, you know, and particularly mental illness plays a a large role with a lot of the characters Mm -hmm. and seeing the intersection of all those things was just breathtaking. Oh, thanks. It's interesting to listen to you talk about this because then I started wondering 
does anybody just exist where they are and think, man, I so belong here. (laughs) (laughs) I, I am completely where I'm supposed to be. And, you know, everybody else is different. Mm -hmm. I'm the one who's, right or correct Mm -hmm. you know like my existence is correct yeah what do you Um, think i have no idea i i it also reminds me of this this is going to seem really off topic but yesterday i went to a a book event for have i'm not i'm going to pronounce your last name wrong but it's heather havreliski um who does the ask polly column Hmm. um and i actually read her new book recently and there was one advice column based around this woman's letter, this young woman's letter about being in her early 20s and the letter was basically saying I'm so weird and I'm afraid that I'm never going to belong anywhere because I'm so weird and she kept trying to use these different examples to prove her weirdness like having Hello Kitty stuff in her bedroom or sleeping with a teddy bear or you know, telling weird jokes in public. And and she kept talking about how she was never going to belong. And in the response, the Ask Polly column <laughs> ended up saying basically, like, you're not that weird. Like, everybody's weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which, which I really liked. But at the same time, I think it's very easy to fall into the trap of believing everybody else is normal and everybody else belongs. And mm-hmm. I just... I'm never going to be that person. Yeah. I think, too, like, one of the things I wonder, I mean, I think everybody does feel alienated on, to some degree, and, and everybody, like, nobody belongs as much as they w- wish they did. Mm-hmm. I think that's probably true. At the same time, like, I think I think about this a lot, how it seems to me that even if that's true, though, that there are some mechanisms of alienation that Mm. that would be more acute than others and you know oh yeah things like race or sexuality or mental illness you know it's not necessarily the same as as somebody just feeling like a a weirdo culture (laughs) like you know like because yes they like science fiction or something you know yes yes i totally agree like i i'm not trying to say that like oh nope ever nobody is normal i i actually hate it when people say that um mm-hmm. but i think what i uh okay so yes i completely agree with you <laughs> i think i think what i was saying maybe ineffectively was that no matter how much you belong in terms of your position of privilege sociologically and socially and culturally, it is amazing to me how much people manage to feel like they don't belong. Yeah. And I certainly don't, I don't mean to minimize that at all. I don't, I, I think that came across uh, <laughs> just fine in, in, in how you put it. Um, you know, and I, and I, I do think that that's something that is, it's worthwhile to keep in mind because, you know, like, like I always say, you know, everybody's problems are our actual problems for them, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And that is something that's, it doesn't mean everybody's problems are severe to the same degree, but it, but I think it is, it certainly just on a personal level worth remembering that we all are struggling in some way to have empathy in that way. Uh, It can be hard to do sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I, I agree. I, okay. I have like a little anecdote. I'm not entirely sure that it fits. Sure in this conversation. But I, so my husband, um, whose name is Chris and I, a couple of years ago, so we went to whole foods and we don't usually shop at whole foods. And the reason that we were going that day was that I just come back from this doctor's appointment and he'd come with me. Um, and I was very sick at the time and I was just first becoming ill with this very mysterious disease. I was not functioning well. I had to leave my job. Uh, They thought I might have cancer. We were doing like MRIs and EGs and like 
CAT scans and CT scans, all kinds of stuff because I was very sick and we didn't know what was wrong anyway. So one thing that my doctor had suggested because they were still trying to figure out what was wrong with me was to take these certain supplements that you could only, apparently only get at Whole Foods. Mm. So I had just come from this doctor's appointment. I had just gotten something like 15 tubes of blood taken um, for various blood tests. And mm. it was just this very upsetting time in our lives. And so Chris and I were at the Whole Foods and we were, we were, had gotten the supplements. We had our basket with the supplements and we're heading towards the checkout line. And I noticed that Chris bumped into somebody and and the person he bumped into looked at him with this incredibly scathing look just like oh my gosh you asshole like how could you bump into me and not acknowledge me and it was interesting because Chris is a really considerate person like he is the person who has to remind me to not go barging into an elevator as soon as it opens because mm -hmm. you have to let the other people out first mm -hmm. um, but it was he was very distracted at the time because he was worried and I remember and he did not notice this person glaring at him and he hadn't realized he had bumped into somebody but I just remember looking at that person and thinking like I'm so sorry. Like, this is not his normal behavior. He didn't notice that he bumped into you. We're going through something really stressful right now. And then as we were in the checkout line, I started thinking to myself, I also don't know what's going on in that person's life. Maybe they're going through something really stressful right now. Maybe like they can't afford anything at Whole Foods and they just come here every day to browse and pretend like they're wealthy enough to be able to afford like a $15 chocolate bar. Hmm. But yeah, so that it was a, that's like a small anecdote <laughs> about an experience that really stuck with me. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think one of the things maybe that the t if 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 that the, if it can tie back into the rest <laughs> of the conversation, but I think that that impulse to to look more closely and to to wonder about what is actually happening. I mean, maybe that is like a very writerly type of thing to do that the impulse to, to, to empathize and to, to see more than just the, the surface, mm -hmm. you know, when you can do that in your writing that, that makes for a, a very compelling narrative. Yeah. I think that might be what ends up creating characters in which you can say like man that person is a real asshole but also to know that there's a lot going on there mm -hmm. besides just the behavior that you're seeing mm -hmm. or reading about yeah so i i don't know if um this is something that you how much you feel comfortable talking about uh but you did you mentioned that um that you had been dealing with an illness. Mm -hmm. That's something I know. I mean, you do speak about it on your, on your blog and on, um, on Twitter a fair amount. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's one of the things that I, I, I think how to put this, you write a lot about different ways to either manage or cope with or work through or don't work through, but be okay with limitations Mm -hmm. that your life circumstances have put on you. And I think a lot of people who read the nonfiction that you write find a lot of inspiration in that. Yeah, that's something that definitely only happened after I started getting sick. So I was diagnosed finally in early 2015 with chronic Lyme disease or late stage Lyme disease. Um, it goes under a couple of different names and it's a controversial diagnosis and the CDC doesn't recognize it um, as it is. But um, anyway, besides all that, what it means for me in my day to day life is that I'm sick to some degree every single day. And that changed a lot of things about the way I needed to operate in life, not just my day to day behavior and such, but also my, the way I thought about things and my attitude. I think it, it's challenging to become very sick for anybody, but I think for me, the biggest challenge was being a really ambitious, um, a really ambitious person who had 
and still has really big dreams, who has always competed. I feel like that's a weird word to use, but competed at a high level. Mm -hmm. And then to, to lose a lot of different levels of ability. So ranging from like not being able to lift my arms or like walk to not being able to have the cognitive ability to write like a sentence or a paragraph or to come up with the words to say what I want to say. And so I still struggle with this, um, the, the kind of tension between having a lot of ambition and having a lot of limitations, but you're right in that over the last couple of years, I kind of struggle with that in public. I, I want people who are in a similar situation. And I think there are a lot of people like this, um, people who are in a similar situation to be able to, to see somebody else talk about it. Mm-hmm. I'm actually teaching a workshop at the get bullish conference in Palm Springs in September um, I'm teaching a workshop called Ask Kicking with Limitations 101, mm. which is kind of the culmination of all of this kind of thinking. Mm. There is a blog post that I wrote that is perennially popular. I think any time it gets discovered and then retweeted and shared a lot, it finds a new audience. And I'm glad, but it, it's basically, um, I think the post is called You Are Not Lazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it's that's yeah, that's basically what the post is about. But I think that's a real concern that people have when they live with any kind of limitations, whether it's illness or something else, caring for caring for elderly and sick parents or um, anything that causes a person to feel limited in what they're able to do or want to do. Mm-hmm. A lot of times I think that limitations cause people to feel lazy and to worry that they're lazy. I also wrote a piece for L.com about this. I can't remember what they ended up calling the article, but that was pretty popular too among especially people with chronic illness. Mm -hmm. I wrote about being worried that I was actually secretly lazy because a lot of the time I'm not able to do things. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that, um, you know, self-acceptance can, can be uh, difficult, I think, for everybody um, at times. And having, having real things in your life that, to struggle against um, makes that more acute. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm not the first person to note this. Um, different people have different opinions on this, but I think right now maybe for the past three, four years that we're in sort of a personal essay, confessional renaissance, perhaps. Mm. And there are some old people who who grumble about that kind of thing. But for me, (laughs) I find it incredibly valuable. And I know a lot of other people do too, that being seeing people willing to be vulnerable in public, and people talking about, you know, the real struggles that they have, on on any topic on any on any level i think that that uh it not only you know humanizes people that we might want to view as celebrities or as you know sort of mysterious artists but also it 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 really provides a, a an opportunity for connection and an opportunity as a reader or an audience member to feel um you know to feel less alone and less isolated and oh, I, I, yeah, I agree completely. I mean, I, I have, I personally, you know, the, I think the reason that I, that I wanted to read your book so much is that reading your essays and, um, your, uh, your journal on your website, all of these things, I think there was a lot in there, even though the circumstances of my life and my struggles are not the same as yours, that there are aspects that, I could relate to and that felt very familiar. And I thought I felt like, you know, a person who can write an essay with this much empathy and can make me feel, you know, emotions so strongly this way. I mean, I can only imagine that I would want to that that her fiction would do just as much or more for me. 
Um, and that turned out to be true. Oh, that makes me really happy. Thank you. So I, uh, I have a whole long list of notes about, about the border of paradise that I don't know if we're going to have time to get to all of them. There's so much to talk about with this, you know, before we switch into the second segment, is there anything that you'd like to touch on about the book that we haven't talked about already? I would be interested to hear your thoughts about the interracial relationship Hmm. between David and Daisy as it's depicted Mm -hmm. in the book and maybe to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I, a huge source of my, um, like the racial, not politics exactly, but how race affects particularly the way David approaches different characters, his wife, his lover, his um, children, that like it was very it was a real point for me it was something that really triggered is not is a little too strong maybe but like it really it really touched something off in me Mm -hmm. um seeing that and and i i i know like at, at different times i would write down in my notebook like you know different things that david would say and and then next year write something like man fuck that guy and <laughs> But I, th- I mean, it was just so interesting because there were these points at which he is being super sexist or super racist towards people that he's close to that he, like, I think legitimately loves. But, and, and that would, would infuriate me because I, I have seen that play out so many times in real life. But then I would also feel like he has a certain self awareness mm-hmm. that, that also sort of pulls me back in. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, particularly his relationship with his, with his two children, this sort of separateness that he feels from his half Asian son, like there's, there's a thing in that, that like particularly where he talks about how he feels very different from his son. And I think there's even, there's a line I wrote this down where he says it's the father who's permitted to lack absolute absorption in his offspring. And when, I read that just like, I just felt this rage because <laughs> it was like, here's a, you know, a thing that like, just love your kids. God damn it. But, <laughs> but I think it, you know, it also touched on things that were like profoundly true. Like, you know, I think, and here's another thing that I'm always impressed by um, writers who can sort of write outside their experience is not something that I've ever been able to do. I mean, obviously we're all, we all have parents and so we all have an experience with that relationship, but I think it's really impressive where the, I think there are aspects of the, of being a parent that are hard to, if not impossible to get at if you haven't lived it yourself. And I know you don't have kids, but there are aspects to that relationship that you wrote from the parental side that just felt like devastatingly true. Oh, I mean, I, I saw you tweet about that and I was, it was one of the, this might be a weird way of putting it, but it was like one of the nicest things anybody had said about my book. I, I was actually very surprised when I saw you say that because I, as a writer who doesn't have children, I had no idea when I was writing it, how it was going to come off, um, whether I would be able to pull it off, whether it would feel at all, realistic or genuine or strike at any kind of emotional resonance. So I was glad to hear that. Yeah. I mean, this thing, I think one thing that is, I, a lot of people don't really realize is that, you know, the standard narrative of, of having children is that it's love at first sight. But, um, you know, this is something I've talked about before that for me, it wasn't love at first sight that like, as my children grow, I, I grow closer and closer to them. But for me, it's, I can't love someone without knowing them. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know someone the first when I first meet them. Mm-hmm. The love that I feel for my children now is so strong that it sometimes literally takes my breath away where like, it feels like there's a weight on my chest and I can't draw a breath. Mm-hmm. But I didn't feel that on the first day with any of them. I have three kids now. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so there is this aspect to David lacking a connection with his kids that, that felt familiar but also, and in, and and in a way, my 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 anger towards his the way he talked about it was maybe an anger towards myself. Um, mm-hmm. Even though I, I I've 
I, I, I think I've forgiven myself for that <laughs> at this point. But I think also, you know, another thing too is that, you know, so I'm, I'm multiracial. I'm three quarters Japanese. I have one, one Caucasian grandparent. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife is Caucasian. And so my kids are less than half Japanese. And that is something that I have thought about. Like, it's something that, like, their experience of life is going to be something so, comp- not completely different, but, and it's going to be different for a lot of reasons other than just that. But that is one thing that separates me from them. Mm-hmm. And, and so, like, I think I reacted to that truth in a different way than David reacts to it. And I hope in a healthier way, but like, it's one of those things that like, I don't think I would have gotten so upset about seeing that in the book if it weren't, if it, if it weren't touching on something true. Yeah. And with David, I think he, he gets rather defensive and afraid about particular things. Like the first thing that comes to mind for me is when he gets in an argument with Daisy about speaking Mandarin to William, Mm. um, And she says something like, well, he's, I I can't remember what, how exactly this conversation goes, but I think he, she says something like, you know, he's Chinese or something. And then David really balks at that. Um, But I think when I was writing that, those scenes and that relationship, I was trying to really dig into David's anxiety about not feeling connected to William, Mm -hmm. his anxiety about William not really looking like him in a lot of ways physically. And then to have this relationship with his son where his son might be fluent or think and speak something that he has no access to. I mean, he could learn Mandarin, but I don't think he would have tried. Mm -hmm. Um, That wasn't really in his wheelhouse. But um, there, I think there was a lot of fear of alienation from his own kid. And I was also interested in what you were saying about your relationship with your children, because this is something that I don't know if you follow Nicole Cliff on Twitter. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah, yeah. Do you remember when she was tweeting about this? So she went on a very long Twitter it wasn't a rant. It was just like a long thread about how both she and her husband did not feel immediate overwhelming love for their children as soon as they were born and how neither of them wanted to admit it Mm -hmm. to one another because they were afraid something was wrong with them or something was wrong with their relationship to their children. Um, And I remember Nicole saying, Oh, by the way, like Nicole Cliff uh, is a co-founder of The Toast, right. which is a website that doesn't exist anymore, oh, um, but <laughs> which is really sad. But um, that, yeah, so that's who Nicole is. Um, but she was saying, I remember, I want to tell people about this because it's something that people don't really talk about and can often be very afraid mm-hmm. of and ashamed of. Yeah, and I remember some of the... She got a lot of positive response to that, but like, you know, I think that that fear that people have about talking about this, how there's really only one acceptable narrative to parenthood, um, Mm -hmm. it really did play out in that thread where she had people who were saying really nasty things about her or her husband. Mm -hmm. And, and so like, I mean, having that fear of, of discussing these things, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a real thing. Um, it's for a real reason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have the people telling you like, you're a monster. How could you not immediately love your child? Mm -hmm. But I was really grateful, even though I don't plan on having children, I was really grateful to see her talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's such a, it's such a, it's a, (sighs) It's one of those things that's a, you know, for me, it's a central aspect of my life. My, my, my parenthood is a big part of my life and my identity, how I think about myself and it, and like anything, it can be kind of fraught. It can be kind of, um, you know, it, it's something that both brings people together and makes you feel very alone sometimes. Yeah. Like I was really interested in, I caught some of your conversation with some people about you having, I think, father in your Twitter profile. Yeah. 
and and how that can have different meanings for different people. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's the thing. Like I have the first two, the first two were like I have a long comma separated laundry list in my Twitter profile, and the first two are dad and husband, and um, and it's just one of those Twitter memes that it's like having an egg avatar that like you know, or an anime <laughs> avatar that like people who put dad husband as their first two things in their bio are almost universally awful and, I actually and did really not know sexist. This. I did not know this. I've never noticed this. Yeah. So I, you're really opening my eyes here. Um, yeah. I first noticed it when uh, somebody pointed out that uh, Barack Obama has that as his thing. And it was, somebody was making a joke about that. Mm. Um, but, but I was like, Oh, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> why? Why do you think that so many people who are terrible on Twitter have that as the first two things on their profile? You know, I think really, I think it really speaks to patriarchy. You know, I think mm -hmm. it really is about, you know, you know, how, how people think about masculinity, how people think about being a husband or being a dad and what that means, what those roles are supposed to be. And I think for a lot of people that those roles they're they they're about authority mm -hmm. in really toxic ways and so even though you might think of yourself as someone who's uh, a parent it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to all people and particularly all men that you know a lot of these guys you might think of themselves as good dads and maybe they are in a lot of ways but they can still be very patronizing mm -hmm. and that's to me it's deeply upsetting because you know i i want fatherhood to mean a particular thing or it to be more inclusive you know i want to be able dads to be able to be seen as nurturing and not just you know the guy who uh grills and and fixes stuff yeah the bumbling the bumbling husband slash father narrative established mm -hmm. by things like uh, uh that tim allen show yeah. improvement um, yeah. things like that it's it's a it's a real thing you know, going back to that thing that you were talking about with um, with David and and with language, that was I thought really interesting. And I know you've spoken about this, written about this, other places that um, your use of untranslated Chinese, but not just untranslated, but also um, unromanized mm -hmm. uh, Chinese, and the way that you use language in this book is is fascinating. I mean, I know that, that that is something you've written about elsewhere. I'll put a link in the show notes to the, uh, the lit hub piece that you wrote, but, but I, I, I did think that that was a really, a really effective way of establishing a sort of feel to the way that these people communicate. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, it was, in, it, it was an interesting way to play around with different layers of understanding, but not only understanding also belonging. Mm -hmm. So there are these different layers of Chinese and English in the book. So there's non-Romanized Chinese characters, which are very difficult to try and translate. It's You can't plug it into Google Translate unless you already have the characters mm -hmm. um, or unless you have a keyboard that can do... Chinese characters. So that's very, that can be very opaque to someone who can't read Chinese. Then there's Pinyin, which is the Romanized version of Mandarin. And with Pinyin, you can sound out the words, which is a certain level of understanding that is closer to true understanding than the more opaque characters. Then there's ways that Daisy interprets English. Um, so there's certain lines of dialogue in the book when she's communicating with someone who's a native English speaker where there are these blank spaces when she mm -hmm. doesn't understand a word. And those I tried to construct as actual sentences. So the blanks that are there are actual words. Mm -hmm. um, they're just not in the text. But yeah, so I was trying to convey different kinds of understanding. And so for myself, I had to come up with different rules for when I would use characters versus using pinyin. There were, so 
one would be if a Chinese character was speaking to another Chinese character, there would be uh, more of the actual <laughs> double meaning of character, actual Chinese characters or the mm-hmm. pictograms. Uh, there would be more of that because there would be this kind of understanding between the two. But there is also a scene where David lifts like a whiskey, like a glass of whiskey, and he says gampe, and that's like a toast uh, mm-hmm. in Mandarin, but it's written in pinyin because David doesn't understand Chinese in that more complex way. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it was it was uh, an adventure, and I I'm glad I tried it. I I I do wonder if I could have been more effective with it, or if I could have done more complicated things with it. But I'm glad that I got to to try that. I it's something that I have not seen in other books. I think there are other books that do similar things. Um, I was in part inspired by Juno Diaz's work. Mm -hmm. And in the piece that you were referring to that I wrote for Lit Hub, in which I explained why I use untranslated Chinese, there's, it opens with an anecdote about a friend of mine who was really angry when uh, the, the Oscar Wilde book came out because there's so much untranslated Spanish in it. And she was so angry that it excluded her from understanding the text. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting, especially because Oscar Wow as a book, like that book is, it's exclusive in multiple ways. Yes. You know, it like, says that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, if you don't understand all of the like D and D and Tolkien and <laughs> yeah. like, you know, if you didn't grow up a total like fantasy nerd the way that he apparently did, like that stuff is going to be at least as exclusive as all the Spanish. Yeah. But uh, but so I mean, it's funny that that would be the the thing that people would hang on to. Although I guess it makes sense as well, just considering the kind of culture that we live in. I found that that book to be so it's it's so interesting because. Like the the references that I got, like I, like when he was making deep cut references to stuff that I knew from my own <laughs> childhood, it was like one of these things that was like, oh my god, this book is about me. Mm-hmm. But but then you know the other parts where it would be, you know, um, I didn't understand stuff. Even you know some of the the cuts were a little too deep even for me, and then I would be like, oh, I, I I I feel a little left out here. But the, I thought like, you know, if you can be self aware enough to examine that reaction. I mean, I think that's kind of the point of it, you know, like the way that it includes or excludes and how that works is, is I think that's, that's kind of brilliant. And the same thing with your book. It's not like, I don't, I can't read Chinese characters. Um, and I can, I only know a little bit of, of Mandarin at all. And only that because I, I took a class in it for my job, but, uh, it's not really that hard to to get the gist of what your characters are saying. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can kind of get the the main feel of it, and and the way that that serves to like it really creates a feeling of because the in, the ability or inability to connect and to communicate is such a powerful theme in the book that it you know by putting you the reader in that position in the same way that the characters are in. I mean that 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 is a uh, it, that is performing a function that I don't know if you could do in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I really wanted to be able to achieve that kind of level of being in someone's shoes, a particular character's shoes to be able to say, I don't understand what this, you know, if you are someone who grew up speaking English, I don't understand what this character who is speaking English in this scene is saying because Mm -hmm. there are words that aren't there Mm -hmm. and to be able to say okay well that's the experience of the character in this in this scene Mm -hmm. who isn't able to understand those words so for the second segment i always ask uh my my guests to bring a topic of their own, um, just whatever is on your mind. So I'm just, uh, what would you like to talk about? I would like to talk about being on Twitter. Okay. (laughs) I think there's so many interesting things about Twitter and the way that it's developed and 
I mean, there are things that are foremost in my mind today in particular um, because of what happened with Leslie Jones yesterday. Oh, yeah. um, so Twitter harassment is kind of foremost on my mind today. But there are things that interest me about Twitter that I feel like don't happen on other social media platforms. These kind of conversations that happen, the way that you can eavesdrop on other conversations if you follow both of the people in the conversation yes. <laughs> um like sometimes i will imagine what twitter would be like if it were in the physical world and it's just fascinating to me i remember the day i realized just how strange it was for me to be able to eavesdrop on com other people's conversations as long as i followed both of them and i tried to imagine this big room of people all having different conversations and just being like magnetized to two people in a corner talking about like their tinder date from mm -hmm. the previous night just because like I happen to know both of them, but yeah, they're. I mean, I'm I'm willing to talk about anything Twitter related. I think it's a fascinating platform and has developed to have so many different facets. Yeah, I always think it's interesting. Like, gosh, you you said so many things that like I think are fascinating. Like that thing about eavesdropping. That's like basically my favorite thing is to <laughs> is to see like two writers that I admire talking to each other and just goofing around is like, that's probably my favorite thing, <laughs> maybe in life, you know, like, I, I, I adore that. I think that may actually be kind of how I ended up finding you is because of uh, a conversation that you were having with maybe Celeste Ng. Yeah. Um, and maybe Nicole Chung. I don't know, like, uh, but, but seeing people talking to each other, I mean, it's great, but this thing that you said about how, you know, if it were in real life, that would be very weird and rude. Like that's a thing, <laughs> the etiquette of, of, of that kind of eavesdropping is it's not quite the same as if it were in real life, but it, there are, I don't know, like this thing about sliding into somebody else's mentions is like, uh, yeah. I don't, I've, I've never quite been able to figure out the the etiquette of it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting because, okay. So say you did not know either, you know, Celeste or me particularly well, but you happen to be able to witness our entire conversation. Like there are people who will jump into that conversation because they're, they're watching it and they have something they want to say. And then all of a sudden you're like, who is this person uh -huh. <laughs> who, who, who wants to like contribute to the conversation? I mean, it's interesting. I guess that is what you mean by sliding into someone's mentions. But yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's something that might happen in real life. Um, if, you know, two people are talking and then somebody just kind of sidles up and, and starts uh, inserting themselves into the conversation. But yeah, I think that is a, a thing that Twitter enables in a mm. particular way that's interesting. And I actually wonder too how the different ways that the technology works impacts the way conversations happen. Like I'm actually not sure when this is going to happen or if it's already happening, but do you remember when Twitter released a whole bunch of changes they were going to make? And one of them was when you start something like when you start a tweet directed at someone you no longer have to put the period in front of that mm -hmm. person's handle in order to make it publicly seen by everybody mm -hmm. um like i went and and how incredibly upset people were about that yeah um because it, it does if it's already happening it does or will shift the way conversations happen and how quote-unquote public or private things are yeah i mean i don't know i think to me, I thought like a lot of the backlash at that point, part of it is that I think a bigger part might have just been that people were upset that they weren't doing, working on things that actually people cared about, like oh, harassment. Yeah. Oh, completely. Yeah. Um, but like, and, and I think that the changes they're making to those kinds of things, some of them are, um, I think that like that period notation is going to continue to be used just to, for people, because they're like, sometimes if you at somebody, it will go, but sometimes it won't. And if you want like the whole conversation to be seen, then it won't necessarily be seen once you start replying. And mm -hmm. I don't know, it's weird. And like the whole thing too, like there, when you talk about uh, at, like at replying people, there's another thing too, that like kind of weirds me out is that how sometimes 
I don't know, like, I, there's just no agreed upon convention where, like, <laughs> I've, like, had people, like, be like, stop, you know, take me out of this. I'm not yes. part of this. You know, stop replying to everybody. But then also, like, I'll do that sometimes and I'll take everybody out except for the person I'm talking to. And they'll be like, hey, why are you, like, only talking to me? This is a big conversation and we should all be having it. Why don't you just, like, be part of the actual discussion? And I'm like, uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here anymore. Yeah, I mean, there's an interesting, there are different layers of Twitter etiquette. I remember seeing, I think it was Feminista Jones who made this long kind of tweet storm re rather recently about Twitter etiquette. And her point was to say that as a semi-public figure, she ends up receiving more trolling and more abuse if people don't use certain kinds of Twitter etiquette mm -hmm. with her with her um, handle. So I think maybe an example she used was if you're talking about DeRay, it's not necessary to use his handle when you're just talking about him because then you end up attracting people to his handle and potentially his mentions. And if, so if somebody finds your tweet upsetting, <laughs> they mm -hmm. might reply to you and then he gets dragged into it. Or, you know, the same thing could happen with her if you decide to say, well, I have a lot of thoughts about racism and someone who also has these thoughts is Feminista Jones, and then you use her handle. Then if like 500 people reply to you with their angry thoughts, then she will get those as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting thing, you know, it's just because for me, a lot of the people that I follow are, you know, they're uh, artists or journalists or, or, you know, and, and, being able to have that kind of access to people, it's something that has never happened before, I feel like. And yeah. it's, it's really changed the conversation, the, the etiquette of, you know, knowing when to include those people. Like, there will be times when you, you want to include people in the conversation, and sometimes that's okay, and sometimes it's not. Um, mm -hmm. And it's hard to sort of feel that out sometimes, but I don't know. I, I do think that a lot of people don't even bother thinking about it, so that's, you know... <laughs> That thing that you, what was it that you said just a minute ago about the kinds of conversations that Twitter enables, I think it's fascinating that one of the things that has been happening to me a lot is that I'll start talking to somebody and I'll, I'll have like, you know, five or six ads in a row, you know, because of the character limit. And then people will be like, you know, we can't have this conversation on Twitter because 140 characters just won't do it. Mm -hmm. And I think what's fascinating to me is that I... I feel like I end up having more impactful and meaningful conversations on Twitter than I do on any other platform, mm -hmm. um, much more than on Facebook, on Instagram, on, you know, LO. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know it still existed, but okay. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it may. I, don't, I think I still get emails from time to time from them saying, please, please use it. Like, they're really trying to make fetch happen. Oh, man. But, uh you know, you look at something like Facebook, there is no character limit on, on posts or replies. Mm -hmm. And yet I don't, I very rarely have substantive conversations there. And a lot of times when I see people posting substantively on Facebook, it kind of seems like, man, why, it's not your blog, just cut it out. Um, well, I think, yeah, those other platforms that you mentioned are not built for conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason that people refer to Twitter as like the water cooler mm -hmm. social media type, because you are, because, at least from my perspective, because you are so limited with with the amount of characters you can use, it is a bit more like having an actual face-to-face -face conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very rare that, you know, it's very frequent that you will be on Facebook and see somebody write this big, long rant about, like, Trump or something. Mm -hmm. It's like five paragraphs of their Trump rage. Mm -hmm. um, but it's much harder to do something like that on Twitter. You're much more likely to have people interacting with you before you can get out your five paragraph rant. Mm -hmm. I just think, I think it's so so fascinating that both the conversations and the relationships on Twitter feel so much more real mm -hmm. than on, you know, other platforms. Um, certainly um, I've had conversations with you that that have meant a lot to me and like i don't know how that would ever have happened at any other time when i could <laughs> write to an art artist or a writer or you know that that i admired and and actually 
you know, have a real conversation with them that it's, it's, uh, it's pretty, I don't know. It's something. It definitely is. And I, I worry, I worry that Twitter is not going to, I mean, I know Twitter is not going to last forever, but I do think about, okay, what would I do if I didn't have access to Twitter anymore because it didn't exist anymore? Part of the reason I became so involved in Twitter and became kind of like a heavy user of Twitter was due to becoming ill. I used Twitter. I became a Twitter user. I I can't even remember. It was fairly early though. Like I've been a early and early adopter of a number of tech things and Twitter was one of them, but I didn't start really using it heavily until I was sick. And that happened because Twitter somehow fits right in that space between mm, what am I trying to say? So like when I'm lying in bed and I don't have the cognitive ability to like read a book or have a conversation with someone face to face, um, let alone sit up to have a conversation with someone face to face, I usually just have enough energy to hold my phone in my hand and tap out some words to to interact with people. And that has been really empowering for me over the last couple of years to Mm. be able to feel like I'm still a part of things. Like I'm still a part of the world. I'm still able to interact with people I admire and people I like to talk to. You know, I might not be able to like go out and get coffee or drinks with somebody the way I used to, but I'm still able to, to interact. And that's, that is part of the reason Twitter has become such a major part of my life in the past couple of years. Yeah. Another thing, you know, when you, I think you talk about the ability to, 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 to remain connected when, when you're not able to in other fashions, but also I know something for me is, is been a, a very valuable thing is that like Twitter for all that the internet can be a total cesspool. Twitter in particular has been sort of this wellspring of support as well Mm -hmm. um, and positivity. And I know like, you know, oftentimes your posts will be that for me or, you know, another person who often is very uh, generous with positivity is um, uh, Sarah Gailey. Mm -hmm. Um, But, and, but there are just a lot of people like that who can just be, very kind to one another, um, or to complete strangers or just to the world. And I don't know, I, I, it's not the kind of thing that I think when I was younger, I would have probably laughed that off a lot more, Mm -hmm. but, but I, it's been surprisingly inspiring. Isn't quite the right word, but something from which I can draw strength at a lot of times when I'm feeling otherwise low. Yeah. Like there are things that happen on Twitter like that, that I can't imagine it happening on any. Okay. So that I can't imagine happening on other social media platforms, first of all, but also that I can't imagine happening quote unquote IRL. Like Mm -hmm. yesterday, um, for example, Nicole Belanger, who I um, follow tweeted, I'm at work and I am not super busy right now. So if you're in need of uh, encouraging DM, like, let me know. And I was feeling really anxious and bad at the moment. So I tweeted at her and I said, hi, like me. And then she sent me this like paragraph of a DM that was so kind and encouraging and specific to me and her relationship with me. And, and I took a screenshot of it and I can't imagine that happening on Facebook and I can't Mm -hmm. imagine that happening on Instagram and I can't imagine that happening in in person with somebody like, I don't know how that would happen um, in person with somebody. Another example is Rachel Syme used to do this a lot. Um, She doesn't quite do it as much anymore, but she used to say, tweet at me a selfie. And then she would give you like a terrific compliment Mm -hmm. (laughs) about your selfie. Like no matter, no matter how quote unquote, like good or bad your selfie was, she Mm -hmm. would say something really delightful and wonderful. And, And I think there are a lot of people that do things like that. And I really like it. Um, it can really be a bright spot in an otherwise dim day. So yeah, that's another thing. Yeah. Um, well, 
I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I, 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 I want to just say though, I really appreciate you taking the time talking with me. I, uh, I just, like I said at the beginning, I enjoyed the hell out of your book and, um, and I really do hope that, you know, hopefully if this can get at least a few more people to read it, that'll certainly make me happy. And, you know, also, also, you know, uh, I'll probably put this in the end of show bumper as well, but like if anybody has, wants to talk to me about your book, I would love for other people to tweet at me and, 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 and to have a conversation about it. Cause I think it's, I think this is one that I'm going to be thinking about for a long time. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was really nice to be able to talk to you and I will see you on Twitter. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So like you just heard, if any of you folks want to talk to me about Esme's book, I'm totally down for that. You can email me about that or catch me on Twitter. Of course, to do that, you'll want to read it yourself. You can find out all about that on Esme's website, esmewang.com slash book. There's a link in the show notes for that. Also, she has a really great newsletter called uh, With Love and Squalor. You can sign up for that on her website at esmewang.com slash e-letter. There's a link for that too in the show notes. I recommend it. I'm signed up for it. I read it whenever she sends a new one. Uh, and that's our show for the week. If you want to get a hold of me, chat, ask questions, whatever, the email address is podcast at keepthechannelopen.com. You can also find me in the show on Twitter at channelopenpod or on Facebook at facebook.com slash keepthechannelopen, all one word. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can do that through iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or pretty much anywhere podcasts can be found. And uh, also, I just want to take a second and say thank you to everyone who has left a review. That really means a lot to me, and it helps the show. If you haven't done that yet, please take a second and do that. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Even just a sentence or two is great. Our theme music is by Poddington Bear. You can find more of his music available for licensing at soundofpicture.com. Next time, I'll be talking with my longtime friend, writer Jose Iriarte, so look forward to that. And as always, remember, keep the channel open.